right, everyone. Welcome to the STOA. Uh, today's session is called uh, Consilience Project at the STOA, Bad Faith Communication. Uh, so what is the Consilience Project for those of you who are discovering this for the first time? I'm gonna put the, the blurb in the chat. Um, Zach, maybe do you want to uh, give a little brief uh, overview of the Consilience Project instead of me reading the, uh, the blurb? Yeah, I mean, the Consilience Project is an attempt to convene a conversation about the most important topics facing civilization and to do that through creating uh, insights foundational to social theory, uh, psychology, uh, you know, game theory, other areas uh, that are relevant to, you know, specifically catastrophic and existential risks. So we're trying to kind of like, you know, begin a very important conversation. Uh, and in fact, you know, this work on bad faith communication <laughs> had to be done as a preamble before other conversations could even take place. And so we're, uh, yeah, in a sense, um, trying to publish and provoke conversation about uh, these topics. So along those lines, and there's a bunch of articles published and there's a book that's going to be produced and then more articles to come over the next, you know, three or four years. And uh, the article uh, we're reading today is the end game of bad faith communication. Um, and uh, Zach Stein, who's a member of the Consilience team, uh, is with us. And Daniel Schmachtenberger uh, was going to be joining us today, but he uh, broke his foot and he's getting his uh, um, x-ray as we speak. So hopefully he has a speedy recovery and he joins us next time. And this is uh, envisioned as a potential series at the STOA, perhaps monthly. Uh, so hopefully have a, a Daniel join us then. And I'm going to take in Zach in a moment, and he's going to summarize the piece and ask him a few questions. And then we'll pivot to your questions rather quickly. So put your questions in the chat anytime. Um, and then we'll be heading to breakout rooms for, for 30 minutes and maybe rooms of, of 10. As well, I sent this on email to everyone. Um, if you'd like to put open this Google Doc up and just put any ideas you have uh, regarding uh, cultivating a culture of good faith communication um, or just general thoughts you'd like to share, uh, feel free to do so in this document. And that will be shared with Zach and Daniel uh, probably later this week. Um, so that being said, uh, I'll take you in, Zach, for summarizing the article. Totally. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to summarize the article, but I'm also going to put it in context because it's actually the, in a sense, the final paper in a series of papers on the nature of contemporary propaganda and kind of large scale strategic communication. Um, so, you know, many of the things that I presuppose in this paper about bad faith communication uh, were laid out in a series of prior papers. You know, so it began with the one on mutually assured destruction <laughs> in information warfare, right? It's a mad info war. That was actually the first in a series of papers on propaganda. Uh, the next one, we don't make propaganda, they do, where we clarify the distinction between education and propaganda, um, uh, and then move through to do very detailed analysis of social media specifically as a kind of propaganda delivery system that's um, very profoundly powerful. And so, you know, the argument uh, fundamentally in the bad faith paper is that um, we've come to be socialized in environments that have been overrun with strategic communication. And some of it's fourth and fifth generational warfare, which is psychological warfare, right? Which is what we talk about in the information war, mutually assured destruction paper, where we say that there's been an arms race in propaganda. And that arms race has resulted in informational weapons of mass destruction, right? So we have computational propaganda that's powerful enough to need to be regulated. It's being coupled with AI. Um, so that's occurring. Uh, and then there's also kind of peak advertising. And of course, advertising is coupled tightly to the history of propaganda, you know, going back through the major figures in both of those fields. Um, and so we're in a situation where the basic informational surround, which is the basic kind of ecosystem in which we socialize, uh, is overrun with strategic communication as it's never been before. So it's kind of like, you know, we've dropped... The, the, the equivalent of an atomic bomb in the informational warfare space. This happened maybe around 2016. Uh, and now we're dealing with kind of this background radiation that's seeping into the life world where 
uh, bad faith communication is becoming normalized because most of the communication we're interacting with or a lot of it, and sometimes the basic frame, like on social media, is basically accepting the inevitability of strategic communication as the only kind of viable form. So we fall back habitually into bad faith communication tactics. Um, so that's kind of the overarching kind of context of where this reflection on the nature of bad faith communication stands in a broader research project, basically about the state of contemporary propaganda, specifically computational propaganda and the power of our phones coupled to social media and a few other technologies to change the context of, so context of socialization so profoundly that we are, um, yeah, again, normalizing bad faith communication. And so bad faith communication is communication where parties begin to feel that there's really no point in continuing to communicate, right? There is not an actual interest in reaching mutual understanding. Uh, there's an interest in some other strategic outcome, right? And so importantly, the interest in reaching mutual understanding, uh, which is key to good faith communication, right? Good faith communication is where both parties are interested in, in gaining mutual understanding, but mutual understanding is not consensus, right? <laughs> it's not consensus. Uh, and in fact, the most important thing to know about this uh, difference between good and bad faith communication is that it doesn't hinge upon everyone kind of believing the same thing or falling into a lockstep consensus. And, oh, and that's what it means to be in good faith is that we can all basically take the same assumptions. It's not the case. Good faith communication is a prerequisite for some kind of learning process where you're committed to mutual understanding, even though you may not actually reach it. And we'll talk a little bit later in a few minutes about non-naive, post-cynical, good faith communication. Um, uh, and there's a lot to say about, you know, in the philosophy of this, right? Uh, uh, Danielle Allen, uh, who's a philosopher uh, at Harvard, has this book, Talking to Strangers, which is a wonderful book about basically, you know, using the history of racial tension in the United States to discuss the need for good faith communication in a democracy. And she stresses that it's not about consensus. Uh, and that it's actually about learning to navigate uh, loss uh, and learning to kind of like hold a conversation in the context of disagreement, that this is prerequisite for anything like a democracy or for an open society. Um, and so, so it's clear that there's a difference between good and bad faith communication, just as in the prior propaganda papers we wrote about the difference between education and propaganda. And the, the difference has to do with strategic communication versus communication that's oriented towards reaching some mutual understanding, a commitment to stay in conversation where the conversation itself feels like it's worth continuing to have this conversation because both parties are committed to reaching an understanding even though it's difficult. Um, it's not everyone sits in a circle and holds hands and says the same thing. <laughs> uh, it's that we learn how to kind of basically argue well and keep the conversation productive. Um, uh, and so it's worth kind of noting that the, uh, you know, the, there's a Habermas, Jürgen Habermas, you can't really talk about communication without talking about Habermas, I think. <laughs> uh, and his work is foundational here. Um, when you think about the difference between communication that's oriented towards a strategic outcome, uh, like an advertisement, right? So an advertisement is a great example of a bad faith communication, almost 100% almost of the time, not always, but almost 100% of the time, where they're not really getting you to understand the situation the way they understand the situation, right? <laughs> they want you to understand the situation in a very specific way so that you will buy their product. Um, and so it's, it's communication, and there's an understanding between you, in a sense, you're, you're getting the meaning of the words, right? Um, but the goal of the speech act is to manipulate despite mutual understanding. Um, whereas, as Habermas is saying, communicative action, which is actually action oriented towards mutual understanding in the interest of collaboration, uh, that's based on this presupposition that, um, you know, there is something like truth, which is to say there is something like an objective state of affairs that exists that we can both orient to. <laughs> uh, and there is something like a better or worse action here, like not a specified moral code, but a sense that there's, it's worth having conversations about what's better or worse. <laughs> and there's a sense of honesty, right? Um, 
that you're reaching mutual understanding. You're at least believing that there's a shared interest in reaching mutual understanding, that the conversation is worth having. So that's that distinction. Um, but what we've gotten into with advertising, and again, fourth and fifth generational warfare, is actually um, really powerful forms of bad faith communication, these tactics, which are outlined in the paper, like you know, a dozen strategies or whatever it is <laughs> for carrying out bad faith tactics. Um, these are just like part of our kind of common sense now <laughs> on social media, which is a bizarre thing to say. And so that's worth noting that it's, um, I believe we've reached a point of, uh, you know, media technology innovation a la, a la Marshall McLuhan, where actually we're becoming wedded to these technologies and those technologies functioning in such a way that they are, you know, basically deeply manipulative. Um, and so that is affecting the way that we end up communicating with others because we communicate through these technologies. Uh, and sometimes it even kind of affects the way we communicate with ourselves. Uh, and this is a Habermasian point that you internalize into your own self conversation. And you can identify with this in your own pathologies. Like when the identity system is under stress, you will lie to yourself about yourself, <laughs> right? Um, there will be systematically distorted communication between your own parts, <laughs> right? Uh, and that's internalizing a communication community outside you which is also mostly relating strategically rather than uh, mutual understanding. Um, and uh, yeah, so the paper lays out those strategies of bad faith. It clarifies that distinction. Uh, and it makes a kind of broader suggestion that it may be that we're so comfortable with bad faith tactics and actually take a kind of pleasure in the entertainment of watching them unfold, uh, which is to say it's like a watching a war <laughs> it's like watching a, like a shoot 'em out movie, you know, um, uh, uh, that, uh, that, yeah, we have to, we actually have to start to reflect on this difference and figure out either, okay, if we want to have good faith communication, do we actually have to leave social media? Is it the case that it's literally designed to create bad faith <laughs> communication? Or is there a way to engage in non-naive, post-cynical, good faith communication where you can actually turn this bad faith communication against itself somehow through a higher order use of these new media? That's an open question to me. Um, because the critique of good faith commu communication is that you're, you become a sucker, right? These people, the system, right? Whoever they are, they've been lying to you for years. Like, why should you in any sense want to cooperate with them, right? Um, you're a sucker, or you're opening yourself to being manipulated, taken in by a, a you know psychopathic actor or whatever who uses your good faith against you to kind of sucker you into some bad situation. So that's naive good faith, and naive good faith actually wants everyone to agree on the same thing. That's also naive good faith. Like, eventually we'll conversate, and you'll basically come to agree with me. <laughs> it's not an interest in mutual understanding, but it's it's a kind of naive good faith, which is dangerous. Um, and then you get burned and you become cynical and you can only operate in bad faith, right? So there's a post-cynical, <laughs> non-naive, good faith communication, um, which I believe exists and is a kind of ideal we need to hold. Um, and it's unexplored in the paper. There's hints, right? Um, I think the question of where it can be done is important. Context is everything, right? Uh, you know, for example, one of the reasons people believe you should not engage in good faith is because people are bad, they're criminals, right? Like they're literally bad guys, they're Nazis. You can't engage in good faith with Nazis, right? But then you have to step back and you think, how should a criminal be treated, right? Should you lie in order to get a criminal prosecuted, right? Should you fabricate evidence to get a criminal prosecuted, for example? Right. That's an interesting question because that's a fundamentally bad faith tactic. Or should you actually try to establish the, tru the truth and reach mutual understanding with the criminal? But again, to do that, you have to have a context in which it's possible. So similarly, if you want to engage in good faith conversation, it, might, it may be impossible on social media. Hypothesis. <laughs> that's certainly possible in person with the right containers and settings. Um, and 
uh, but this open question, which I think is worth exploring is, you know, what are those forms? Do we have models? Have we seen examples of non-naive post-cynical good faith communication? Like, is that a political strategy? <laughs> and non-naive means it's, it has to be post-tragic, like it's completely aware of how ridiculous it is to try to engage in good faith with some types of people, but you have to do it anyway. And this is this insight, which is a post-conventional insight into the inevitability of having to live with everybody. <laughs> um, that, that there can't be people fundamentally outside the circle of who we believe it's worth being in mutual understanding with doesn't mean we agree with them at all. And in fact, we could so fundamentally disagree with them that we have to execute you know, legal procedures on them, but the legal procedures end up being good faith legal procedures, right? Or else everything's a, a farce. Uh, so that's how fundamental the good faith communication is, is that it's, it's the, it would have to characterize even the way we treat those people who you know, have done the worst, is that we want to stay in communication with them to reach mutual understanding. Um, and so in that sense, I think it's uh, yeah, this open question of under current conditions, um, you know, how do you do it? <laughs> how do you come with good faith communication when the whole ecosystem, or at least you know, a lot of your a lot of your experience is with is with strategic communication like advertising um, and uh, the nature of argumentation on on social media typically being so bombastic and uh, <laughs> full of bad faith tactics that it's akin to watching like a karate fight as opposed to an argument or something. So, so I'll pause there actually, I think, and, and see where the questions land. I can elaborate on what I spoke to or answer specific questions. Yeah. So uh, start putting your questions in the chat um, and uh, I'll post again the, the Google doc if you'd like to add anything there. And I'll warm up Zach with uh, maybe two questions. Um, yeah, since uh, writing the article or since it got released, um, any like like technologies or cultural movements uh, you found promising uh, or inspiring related to cultivating a non-naive uh, post-cynical communication style? Uh, I mean, there are <clears throat> there are several groups, uh, usually coming out of the context of trying to get the left and right to talk to one another in kind of American political space. And so there's, there are several groups in there that I've seen. Um, the, Better, the Better Angels Project um, is one example. Um, and in all these cases, the goal is actually to get people to be in like you know, living room sized conversations, right? Like manageable conversations and to give people uh, reflective metacognitive kind of toolkits that help them kind of go in with the right frame of mind. And um, so those kinds of things I think are 100% worth doing. And it's, it's actually not a huge, difficult technical problem to solve. Um, it actually requires a bare minimum of facilitation and training and again, certain reflective tools that allow people to pull back from the reactive <laughs> fall into bad faith tactics and kind of remind themselves of the higher purpose of why they're talking to their neighbors. Right, you can't, you know, it's like it's unlikely your neighbors are actually insane, <laughs> even though on Facebook they will you'd be led to believe because they have that bumper sticker, they're probably insane or something, right? So, we have to pull back from the reactive bad faith tactics that have us create this circle of people it's not worth communicating with. Um, and the best way to do that is to rehumanize people and bring them together. And so, there's I've seen a lot of uh work in that space in the political sphere, uh, and then of course, in education reform you know, the teacher-student relationship, the way school communities run, um, you know, this is another place where, although they're not kind of, it's not going under this rubric, as it were, of bad faith, good faith, it's still about, you know, uh, restructuring the interpersonal spaces in school so that kids feel less coerced and that teachers feel less coerced <laughs> and that there's actually a, you know, good faith uh, participation uh, in uh, learning. Um, together. And, and by the way, you know, real learning requires good faith cooperation between teacher and student. Um, that's like a prerequisite. So, so that's some like vague examples and, and one project. Uh, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a space of innovation, basically, at this point, because we're, 
Um, you know, we have to protect the life world from colonization, as Habermas would say, like the, all the strategic instruments of the system are colonizing the life world into the very fabric of our communication. And so it's, uh, there's actually almost like a green tech kind of initiative that needs to go on with the newosphere where we begin to try to protect <laughs> uh, the uh, kind of, you know, exhaustible resources of the, of the life world. And, the, and some of the resources of the life world are things like trust right? Like trust. If you, you can actually sap all the trust out of a society, if you want, you could, you could through coercive strategic communication, you can just sap it out. And so it's actually, we're in a fight to protect the resources of the life world um, from colonization. My follow-up question is if there was like a community of practitioners who wanted to get better at good faith communication, uh, what would their ecology of practice be? And this is an open question to everyone in the in the room right now. Um, and like, I'm thinking things like, not only the, some of the modalities that you've uh, a gesture towards, but things like um, emotional agency, things to cultivate emotional agency, how to actually like, you know, structure a good argument. Um, like anything come to mind for you in that regard? The first thing that comes to mind is just that it's, you know, getting together a small group, like a family, or community like a like a larger house of you know 15 people or something it's fairly easy to get good faith communication going on there because that there you're dealing with individual psychopathology and things like that and so you can get a family system working the the real issue here has to do with public communication uh and specifically public political communication or public let's say scientific communication right uh and this is where there's a whole other set of dynamics, which it's harder to know how to intervene. Because as a psychologist, I can think, oh, okay, you're in a family system where there's systematically distorted communication, uh, or you're in a school where there's this incredible competition between kids and everyone acts strategically towards one another. Um, let's get small groups going where you learn what it's like to just, you know, in good faith communicate and be interested in other people's opinions and learn to understand them and that kind of stuff. But when you're looking at public communication, uh, and, you know, the things that occur between journalists and their audiences um, uh, and between politicians, speech writers, uh, and the public and, and in these domains, this is where the concern about the sapping of trust and legitimacy from the system becomes so profound. Um, and so that, so I'm saying like, yes, we can innovate in the micro, and create healthy community where there's good faith among a local sangha or tribe, right? And then this question of how to have, and it's probably like a question of governance design and social technology design. How do you have a public sphere in which public communication is felt to be and actually is in good faith? Uh, and that's a, that's a deeper question, which I think, I, again, I, I do not have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> but I know it's an important question and would love to hear people's ideas about that actually, you know, because I think we kind of know how to diagnose, which is to say, I think we, we kind of know why it is so overrun of bad faith communication, at least in part. Um, and it's not like uh, it hasn't been before, you know, the history of propaganda, which is laid out pretty well in those papers I named when I started the history of propaganda shows that, you know, the New York Times has been manipulating us for <laughs> for decades, uh, and you know, so is the you know the 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 agencies of government that are funded to run propaganda campaigns. Um, so it's not like it's it's a new thing, but we have crossed some kind of a threshold. We've crossed a threshold where we need to figure out how to rein it in and recreate the instruments of governance and communication to allow for. A, an, an accurate sense of good faith um, and uh, again, legitimacy of, you know, the, the worthwhileness of continuing conversation with our fellow citizen. And if you have any uh, ideas, you can put in the Google doc and feel free to comment on each other's uh, shares. I'm gonna tag in uh, some people for questions now. Ariel, you had a question. Uh, yeah, um, I guess I found it a little troubling that good faith communication is predicated on um, a shared belief in a mutually knowable objective truth. Um, like that framework is kind of considered 
philosophically problematic and a lot of people it's considered passe like a lot of people don't embrace that um framework so i'm wondering how good faith communication addresses that so i yeah i brought up habermas's formal pragmatics of communication which is a fairly you know it's a it's a, like a deep deeply thought out way of thinking about communication and by his definition yes good faith requires that presupposition and it's not that it's even a nameable fact which is to say it's not that we have to agree on a scientific theory of reality it's that there there when we make claims like the claim uh that for example this way of thinking about things is passe like when you make that claim this way of thinking about things is philosophically passe is are you claiming that's an objective state of affairs or not I think you are, and that's cool. And I agree that you're right. It is in postmodernism passe. But Habermas is saying that you can't really get communication off the ground uh, without at least a presupposition that there's some shared objective world. We may not even be able to understand it well, but it's worth communicating about it. Like if we were fixing a shed together, we're fixing a bicycle, and we were making co-reference, you know, through indexicals uh, in a kind of deeply pragmatic way about an object that we were collaborating to try to fix. Uh, we would just assume that there's a pretty reliable objective reality that one could be wrong or right about because either the bike would run or it wouldn't run. Um, and uh, so in that sense, it's like that kind of basic stuff. And uh, if you're operating in bad faith, you won't be able to fix the bikes. You won't be able to fix the bike together, really. <laughs> yeah, there'd be a limited like little space where you were cooperating at least enough to agree on like <laughs> how the bike works. Um, so, and but then that's Habermasian. You don't even have to go there. In the definition that's in the paper, uh, it doesn't really assume that there's a there's an objective reality. It just assumes that there's enough uh, agreement and the basically quote unquote good faith that it's worth continuing the conversation. That you don't want to cut off conversation in the interest of purely strategic action. Um, that uh, there's that baseline of agreement. Yeah. So, so that would be my my answer, which seems decided, seems not satisfied. <laughs> Which is good. I guess, I guess part of my question was also about the unpopularity of that philosophy. Like, it does seem like it almost seems like there's like a labeling of everyone who has like a postmodern framework as being in bad faith, which mm. seems like a little bit of a uh, maybe a misunderstanding. Yeah. No. Oh no. I mean, it's not. It's not the case. Most people don't operate in bad faith all the time. Um, uh, it's not the case. And, uh, you know, Baudrillard, like simulation sim simulacra, uh, that work is a remarkable work and offered in good faith to try to help us get out of this simulation. It's one of the most deeply postmodern works. Um, but you end up in a performative contradiction a lot, um, which is when you're your, your arguments rely upon, for example, a fact stating discourse about the world. But then you say fact stating discourses actually don't exist. But that's right there, you're stating some kind of fact that it doesn't exist. <laughs> so there's a performative contradiction, which once postmodernism got going, was pointed out by others, including Habermas. Um, and uh, and so in that sense, that's not that's not bad faith. It's kind of a it's a mistake in the domain of pra pragmatics, which is a theory practice problem. And it's it's hard to it's hard to name that, but that I think is what it is. Um, and so it's not the case that all postmodernists are in are in bad faith. Um, in fact, most academics I don't think operate in bad faith, <laughs> um, even though they're competing. Um, but the postmodern public sphere, the late capitalist kind of postmodern public sphere, you could argue has has mostly been overrun with bad faith communication. Um, if you combine all the effects of advertising and propaganda, et cetera. So maybe that helps clarify what, what I was saying. Um, um, Evan McMullen, you had a question? Yeah, thanks, Peter. Um, so my question is sort of uh, in a similar vein as Ariel's, I think, but I'm, I'm interested in a specific aspect of this. So to me, as she was pointing out, one of the most difficult aspects of having good faith 
communication involves the fact that we have very different cultural groups that nonetheless share physical and social proximity, which seem to have adopted mutually incompatible reality tunnels or working ontologies um, with such fundamental different, fundamentally different organizing principles and assumptions that the process of reaching any sort of common ground at all can take like many, many hours, days, even years of, of good faith dialogue. And this appears to me to be the result of deliberate moves by fairly savvy political and economic actors engaging in bad faith communication in order to cause the situation. So um, doing that requires a lot less, to causing the situation seems to require a lot less time investment, um, you know, than, than fixing the situation. So um, I'm curious about this dynamic and specifically you had talked earlier about the sort of rehumanization step, like, okay, so I'm dealing with a guy, he's got a very different worldview, reality, tunnel, ontology, what have you than me, and this is going to make communication, even when done in the best of faith between us, very difficult. So I'm, I'm specifically curious about how this works in your view between this rehumanization step. So I've got a guy who's coming from a very different place. We disagree about some almost axiomatic things in our ontologies, and yet I want to have a good faith conversation where we can talk about, say, a local policy debate, like in my small town that I live in or something productively, without constantly getting pulled off into the very different assumptions we might make about value and how to realize value or some, something like that. So um, can, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. I mean, I would actually, I mean, what do you think? Because <laughs> again, it's very context specific. So like depending on who your neighbor is, where you live, if you're in a rural or an urban area, um, if the axiomatic disagreements are in some areas as opposed to other areas. And so they know the, the post-conventional post in general tends to like constellate for uniqueness. It doesn't constellate for routineness, um, which means it's a, it's a, it requires a high degree of like consciousness and adaptability in every conversation. Um, that's like a very vague thing I can say, <laughs> uh, you know, um, as I, as with the example with the bike, if it is possible to get down to places where as in meal preparation or neighborhood cleanup or things of that nature, where you're at a sensory motor and representational level kind of conversations, uh, and then build trust in those areas, uh, and often also recognize weaknesses and unwillingnesses in those areas, um, you know, uh, you know, the left-right divide uh, in the United States often is also the, the, the divide between the talking classes and the kind of classes that actually manipulate physical objects in space, like your plumbing, right? Uh, and so bridging the divide between the talking classes and those classes that manipulate the physical world um, uh, requires often getting down to what, they, what, what can be shared in common, which is some kind of, you know, radically local problem. Um, and but yes, at the level of axiomatic abstractions, where both parties have been propagandized since what age five, uh, how long will it take to actually bridge those very abstract ideological differences? You know, that can take a long time, which is why you have to have some kind of foundation of cooperation on a shared project that's in both of your interests to, to right. solve. That needs to be solved regardless of those commitments and axiomatic kind of basically, you know, thought terminating cliches you've collected from years of being propagandized and advertised into being unable to think for yourself, right? Which is, you know, the question of how to get out of that simulation and into conversations about reality um, is a hard conversation to have because the simulation is, is deep. Right. So this is essentially the exact type of situation I'm asking about because I do a lot of shared projects with hands kind of stuff, right? Like I, um, you know, local farms, that kind of thing, like going, fixing things, doing stuff for people, building stuff that that's, I have good relationships with a lot of people who might disagree with me um, pretty strongly on the higher level abstract stuff founded on that type of interaction. And yet I notice that there seems to be a very sort of, you know, uh, triggered, limbic, hijacked, whatever you want to call it, kind of response when like a certain barrier of non-locality is crossed. And this barrier can become crossed even when talking about extremely local and relevant, um, you know, say policy issues, right? Where you essentially can uh, come pretty close to indexically pointing at 
the sort of consequences that would be had for our shared endeavors and, and meet space or whatever. Um, and yet there's, there's a, a real hard bridge to cross there with, for example, like I've seen this a lot over the past few years with COVID and, and how that should be treated in local communities, uh, despite the fact that you may have, you know, built a shed with this dude or whatever. Yeah, totally, man. Yeah. And then again, I, I, this is an open, this is an open question. I mean, I think, um, you know, a few things worth saying is that the, the concept of teacherly authority is not irrelevant here, which is to say, uh, in both directions, both parties usually have something to teach the other. Um, and, you know, the question of how to arrange for context, again, it's not just up to you, you need a container where there's an allowance for a reciprocating teacherly authority. Um, and in those specific, in the abstract domains, which means, uh, you know, um, agreeing to be, you know, quote unquote, exposed <laughs> to ideas that you disagree with, right? You didn't say that, but like, that's one of the ways you think about not engaging in good faith communication is to say that it's actually dangerous to be exposed to, for example, people's conspiracy theories or something, right? So like that willingness to have some kind of reciprocation in these asymmetric knowledge transfers, which is teacherly authority. So again, I'm being very abstract because, you know, it's a case by case basis, um, I believe, and when we're at this level. And again, we're still talking about the micro, when you look at the macro, which is to say how to change the types of media conversations and journalistic coverages and, and speech writing and things so that so that down here at the micro it becomes less problematic right because it's there's the relation between the state of the public culture and the state of our minds as we try to to speak to one another um, so i'll kind of leave it at that but uh again i don't have answers i'm actually interested in <laughs> if people have tried strategies you know Thank you, Evan. Um, Katie, uh, you had a question. Um, yeah, so when I was hearing you speak, a, a couple ideas were coming up in my mind. Um, the, the big issue that I see is that bad faith communication tends to be really punchy and sticky and memeable and like certain types of it anyway. And that's kind of why people do it um, because it, it it resonates more in public minds and it's easier it's it's more easily spreadable um on mass than nuanced good faith communication steel manning your opponents etc um, another thing is that if someone who's promoting ideas that you agree with is using these bad faith communication tactics. It for a lot of people it makes them feel good because it's like, ooh, I have this sick burn on my opponent, and it kind of like rallies the troops. Um, so I was wondering if, in your ideas on good faith communication, you've given thought to um, communicating in ways that are both in good faith but also still highly uh, spreadable <laughs> um, and like very punchy. Or is that against the purpose? And if it is, like, how can we expect it to win? You know, it's a good, it's an excellent question because it's kind of like saying that, um, you know, we're so used to being exposed to advertisement and propaganda, which is literally designed to be exciting and kind of grab the limbic system and to repeat in your head and to be easily repeatable to others in speech. So the notion of what I, the thought terminating cliche, which I mentioned before, which is both in advertising and propaganda, it just gives you a slogan and it's like a mantra. <laughs> uh, and so we're used to that form of communication. And we think sometimes that, well, if you have a good message to give, right? Well, that we can use the same tactics to deliver the good message. <laughs> but the problem is that it is a medium is the message kind of problem where, uh, you know, it's not that good faith communication isn't powerful, it is powerful. Um, but because it is unwilling to, uh, you know, even strategically, in a sense, hook you through, uh, you know, a certain kind of meme, right? But it's worth saying that uh, the truth, there's a hunger for the truth, right? Now that is like, it's faked in bad faith, <laughs> right? The hunger for the truth is co-opted in bad faith, uh, but it's there. 
Um, and so in a sense, when you're in a context of totalized strategic communication, you end up wanting to seek out sincere communication desperately. So you can be taken advantage of by bad faith actors, it's bad, but there's also this desire and a, and a knowing that can tell the difference. Um, so what I think is that, you know, the strategy isn't to compete with bad faith tactics with a similar level of razzle dazzle, right? It's to be able to somehow create these contexts that people can take refuge in, which are like demilitarized zones <laughs> where socialization can be safe, right? Um, and communication can be uh, as in good faith as possible, right? Uh, and so it, it ends up being like taking the battle out of the mimetic conflict and into some kind of design problem for social space um, and uh, into some kind of asking of like, how do we convene conversations? How do we uh, bring people into good faith communication, let's say off of social media or in different contexts um, where there's mediation or moderation, um, things of that nature. So that's what comes to mind first. Any follow-up, Katie, or? Well, okay, let me think. I, I, I think that that's important, creating these contexts for, for good faith communication that doesn't grab you. Um, and I think that like, this is an example of one such space, but like, for example, I've seen many cases of, of people who, um, who often like in the public sphere communicate using kind of like razzle-dazzle bad faith tactics. Um, in the private sphere, or even sometimes just in long form content that they release on their same channels, communicating in good faith. So it, like, I don't know, like is the hope that because of the nature of these good faith spaces, people when they see them will naturally be drawn to them and just leave the other stuff aside? Or do you think that there's space for meaning an idea like a thought stopping cliche, for example? Yeah. I mean, I think that's a great idea. Please do that. <laughs> like I would love to see memes that, you know, do some culture jamming uh, in the space of like the normalization of bad faith. Um, uh, I, and one thing I think I'll mention here, which is art, right? Which comes out of left field and Art is, in fact, when done in good faith, um, much more powerful than any strategic meme. Now, of course, art has in large part been, not large part, but has been co-opted by advertising to some extent, right? But the authentic aesthetic expression as a beacon and invitation into good faith communication, uh, the symbolic or imagistic aesthetic expression that's offered as a sincere cry and expressive cry that doesn't even orient towards mutual understanding, strictly speaking, because it's an aesthetic modality. Again, this is Habermas's thinking, <laughs> right? That the aesthetic allows for the altering of culture, changing the mood of the culture, uh, and then you can have a different kind of conversation. So it's worth mentioning that, yeah, many of the fixes here may not be, strictly speaking, um, as I've been suggesting in like technology and governance design, that there's, room for agency in the domain of the aesthetic and the artistic, I think as well, um, which is again, a different fundamentally different kind of communicative act, which is an expressive act of sincerity and authenticity, let's say. Um, uh, uh, so I'll offer that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Um, this might be the, the last question before we go to breakout rooms, but uh, Yuli, you had a, a bunch of questions if you wanna Choose one. Uh, Thank you. Uh, so let me just uh, scroll through and see which one I want to focus on. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so I'm really curious about what a good starting model might be for ways to look at a human system in the context of um, people building non-naive trust uh, such that they can actually find things to bond on that might not go all the way to the like ontological or metaphysics level or something like that. So as people are 
you know, in some contexts, they will emerge naturally. They got to work together for some stuff, build a shed together, whatever. In other contexts, we're trying to create a container. We're trying to create a context where there can be a longer term learning relationship together, people that support each other in the practice of good faith communication. So what, what are some ways of thinking about a human system, like a human, that, like a starting model, that enables us to more non-naively look at how do we actually build that trust, you know, the nervous system level, psychological level. Um, but, but of course, you know, take that whatever you like. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's a, it's a foundational question. Um, and, uh, you know, I believe that, you know, this is one of the reasons we need psychology, sociology, and humanities, and other dimensions of kind of self-understanding of the species, right? How do we deepen our understanding of ourselves so that we can actually build and create environments that allow us to be you know, um, uh, I don't know whether I healthy <laughs> or um, non, uh, you know, non self terminating, at least <laughs> at the level of uh, psychopathology and civilizational, um, you know, design. So in that sense, I think the question you're asking is a deep one, which one can't solve in the back of a napkin, you know, like here with you, like it's about uh, what do we really think the need to, how, how does the human psyche work? Uh, how, you know, which is a complex, how do relationships function? Yeah, it's, it's like, it's kind of that simple. <laughs> and now the problem is that the, you know, the academic production of psych psychological and sociological research has been part of this whole fourth, fifth generational warfare that's been unfolding since the Cold War, right? So there's like a full stop when you do propaganda research and realize how deep uh, and how interesting the relationships are with some of our basic institutions. Um, and so what we're looking at here is a situation where though the basic questions we're asking are in psychology, sociology, anthropology, archeology, span places like that, um, putting together a coherent picture is, is difficult. Um, and uh, so, so I leave it at that <laughs> as like a research project. Uh, I have my own thoughts and work in metapsychology and and have ways of thinking about the human. Um, but you know, it's it's a it's a large project. Um, sometime under the heading of you know ontological design or value sensitive design, uh, which is you know think and this is the next consilience paper to drop, which will be basically probably this weekend, which will be about the nature of technology and how to design, you know, you want to design technology that factors second and third order effects on human minds and cultures and relationships. Uh, and so in that sense, this question of how do we design it? Well, we have to take a step back and think, how does the human, how do value systems work, right? How do values interpenetrate with behavior and relationship? And how does introducing something like a smartphone have effects on value and culture completely unpredictable. <laughs> like you just thought you were going to get people, you know, able to order food and like communicate, but in fact, you've changed our nervous systems to the extent that we offboard things like navigation to a GPS, right? Um, uh, and then forget how to find our way around, um, uh, which wasn't an intended consequence of the technology. They didn't intend to, to, to degrade our spatial awareness with a GPS, but it was a, it was a side effect of the GPS. Um, and so that question of ontological design is how does one deeply consider thinking through, um, uh, sometimes we call it axiological design. Axiology is about the study of value. So axiological design is concerning, you know, factoring human value and human nature, quote unquote, for lack of a better term, in technology design. Um, at least as important or more important than like how much money it will make if you, if you, if you release it, <laughs> which in, in many senses is the more fundamental question guiding design due to venture capital speculation and other things in, tech, in the tech industry, which makes it have to return profit. So the concern there is making money as opposed to shaping humanity and fundamentally shaping the presuppositions of what is valuable, what is where should I how and steward my attention, right? Which is a, which is a sacred question um, that we've given over to these technologists. 
So, so you're asking the right question and, um, you know, uh, get back to me <laughs> when you've, uh, when you've gotten into the, you know, into the research and the literature, my friend. Uh, I have one follow up. That's cool, Peter. All right. Um, so I've actually gotten a lot of value from the meta psychology talks you've done here at the STOA and had been working on something that just sort of naturally came up for me that's very fit well with your model of uh, insolment development and transcendence, which I've been simplifying to a think, feel, do um, uh, from my own sense making. And, and what struck out to me from what you've just shared as like, kind of like, well, you know, we can't predict all the outcomes of the social systems. They're not controllable. And I'm thinking about like, what, what models or practices or processes, maybe a model as a practice or a model as a process, um, you know, afford the flowing with the uncertainty and the unpredictable nature of how these social dynamics and psychic dynamics and uh, will, will interact, um, kind of with that, what affords us ease, even though we generally culturally um, have a strong desire for like, I want certainty, I want control, I want the perfect model, I want it to be all sort of like top down of all um, and, you know, legible to every academic institution. So I bring that in, but I'm yep. just going to share a tiny bit of personal context. Just say, this is directly to me relevant. I use that. I use this thinking, this think, feel, do model to think about how does my system flow in a given interaction? How's it flowing right now? Am I like feeling my words? Am I doing something from that feeling? Is there thinking involved? Are they synergistic enough? And it's becoming a practice for me in a way that feels relevant to cultural contexts and work and a lot of other areas. And lastly, sorry for my long answer, from that, from saying I got a lot out of this, it's actually also personal for me. I want to say one, one drop I'd like to make into the collective conversation is something like, you know, if our sense making in academia is going so fast, so fragile, so competitive that it can't slow down to have people come in to see what is the process, what is the interdisciplinary uh, communication that actually works? Can we find something that allows us to deal with all the complexity and uncertainty of the process and not us clinging to control? Um, yeah, that feels really important to me. And I'm, and I'm somehow kind of asking like, yeah, how do, we, how do we insert processes that are translatable? Maybe the think, feel, do has a, has a let's build a bike together equivalent of like, you know, you know, different words for the same process that are at the object level of building a bike or at the object level of let's get sociology and psychology and physics talking to each other or something. So that's what I'd like to drop in as part of our ongoing inquiry. Interesting. Yeah, so there's a lot there. Um, so two things I'll pull out. One is that yeah, the need for transdisciplinary uh, work on the meta crisis that transcends and includes ongoing academic work at universities is a, quite a dire need. Um, uh, so this notion of what are the higher order collaboration processes that enable academics from different disciplines to agree on a definition of the meta crisis well enough to actually create usable knowledge that's truly transdisciplinary, which is the only way to go, um, and international, by the way. <laughs> uh, and so that's key. And uh, problems, uh, you know, I've, uh, Donald Campbell was thinking about this back in the 60s, one of my you know, great psychologists. So there's a lot of good thinking in the field here about transdisciplinarity, um, but there are barriers uh, having to do with, you know, uh, things as simple as how universities are structured as businesses uh, and other things that stop certain types of innovation occur. Um, but there is a lot of work going on in that area. Um, and then the other one is a deeper question, which is kind of like, how the hell do you get used to not knowing what's going on or what's going to happen? <laughs> uh, which is important because at least you've admitted that you don't know what's going to happen and you don't know exactly what's going on. Um, and that's very important to get when you're thinking about designing social spaces or technologies, is that the world is in such a complex state right now that it's very difficult to predict second, third order effects, that there's cause for pause constantly. Uh, and in the metapsychology, there's a certain level of complexity in developmental modeling that allows you to think about that 
complexity science, right? Like we actually know how chaos works in a complex cognitive way. But then in the domain of ensoulment, there's also a certain maturity, a capacity to hold discomfort, to hold depression, to hold confusion and anger, which comes from unresolvable problems in the noetic space, which are, will not be resolved, sorry. <laughs> like polarities exist that are meant to be unresolved, that create tension, that create growth. And then of course in transcendence, that's the easiest way to deal with uncertainty is to you know, move into a domain of symbolic immortality through the augmentation of awareness to basically hold you know, the unchanging um, underneath the fact that <laughs> you have no idea what's gonna happen. <laughs> Uh, and so that's emotional self-regulation at a very basic level in the face of basically what is ultimately a fear of death, which is why you want to control. So, so there's a lot in that space to think about. Um, and uh, again, one of the things that kind of characterizes post-conventional, kind of post-cynical, non-naive good faith is the improvisational attentiveness to emergent uniqueness and, and possibility. Um, which is a mouthful, <laughs> but it's the refusal to put people into stereotypical categories uh, and the refusal to like close down possibility in conversation. So it's this kind of like almost a kind of outrageous opening or kind of like uh, irrational opening uh, to exploration, um, which is, again, needs to be done post-cynical, non-naive. You don't want to open yourself up to a psycho, <laughs> right? But you do want to have a, a change of, in stance, which requires not just cognitive development, but yeah, these dynamics of ensoulment and transcendence to bring it into my model. But there's other models you could use in psychology to think through, you know, similar problems. Um, the think, feel, do is is another triple in psychology that was used uh, by Steiner, for example, Rudolf Steiner. That's the basis of his model. So if you want to expand your explorations of the meta psychology to Steiner's psychology, you'd find there the think, feel, do um, uh, triple. Awesome. Thank you, Yuli. Uh, so we're going to uh, stop the Q&A now and we're going to go to uh, breakout rooms. Um, if you have any uh, kind of questions that you'd like Zach or Daniel to read or any ideas, feel free to put it on this Google Doc. Um, and Zach, before we let people in, uh, I asked you what kind of uh, what's something you might want to get from the collective intelligence here um, and yourself. And you mentioned something about uh, personal practices on how to deal with um, good faith or how to cultivate good faith communication. Um, is, is there anything you'd like to elaborate that or anything you think would be a good seed for the conversations we have in the breakout room? I mean, we, we talked about a lot and that came up repeatedly where I was kind of trying to say, hey, I don't actually know what, you know, post-cynical, non-naive, good faith communication looks like in your context, in on social media, where it needs to take place. So to me, that's a very open question like for exploration and innovation. And I even think it's like a, it's a space of almost like entrepreneurial ambition should be put into figuring out how to create spaces where people can actually communicate in good faith uh, or be trained to have certain way of relating to this environment that's trying to manipulate them um, through political propaganda, advertising, et cetera. So, so yeah, anything there in the domain of, uh, yeah, Examples from your own experience, richly textured anthropological data would be very useful, just like stories <laughs> about bad faith communication and how one countered it one time and it was successful, where that level of like exploring what works because the environment's so novel. So um, it's quite an open invitation, I would suppose. Awesome. Um, and uh, I know you're going to uh, slip out now, Zach. Any parting words you'd like to leave us with before uh, you head out? Uh, only just to thank you guys for the interest. And you know, this will be a recurring, uh, we hope, uh, thing where the Consilience Project shows up, you know, maybe on a monthly basis and discusses one of the key thematics or essays, you know. Um, and uh, so this I think is useful. And the more the breakout groups create this kind of usable knowledge, then what the edit, you know, the editorial team from the Consilience Project wants to learn basically from the readership. Uh, how this is going and where future problems could lie and how our current thinking could be improved. So to that extent, we're hoping to be in a kind of learning process in good faith with, you know, the community of the, of the STOA over, over time as the project grows and we, you know, 
publish more papers and just keep the conversation going here. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, uh, my friend, for coming to the STOA today and uh, give Daniel our well wishes and a speedy uh, recovery. Yeah, he'll, he'll be all right. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Take care. Yeah. Thanks. And if uh, anyone has to slip out now, feel free to slip out. But uh, I'm going to put um, 25 minutes on the, the clock and we're going to go into breakout rooms, maybe uh, five to eight. Uh, and the general conversation is, uh, you know, how to cultivate post cynical, non naive conversational spaces, or just anything that you know came alive uh, for you today. And um, yeah, whoever has the best uh, good faith communication skills will uh, take the lead in the conversation. How about that? Uh, so uh, we will go into breakout rooms now.